welcome to Go on the Run, and this is Go Reflection Part 4. Now, this is a viewer slash subscriber request for another video on Go Reflection, specifically to see how to create structures at runtime. Now, I mentioned in part three that it is possible to create a structure at runtime. Basically, let's say, for example, you had some data uh, from some source and it was described, like it had metadata associated with it, right? And so then you can create a structure for whatever reason to store that data and maybe pass it on to the rest of your Go application so they don't have to deal with that unstructured data. All right, and so this user um, said, hey, I am doing a ORM, a Object Relational Mapper, which is a piece of code that maps from, you know, data from the relational world, like RDBMS, to the object world or vice versa. So, and so um, this is the video to try and demonstrate how that would be done. So without further ado, let's jump in. I am taking a slow approach to evolving this example. So if you're the impatient type, maybe you might want to skip to much farther in the video or speed it up. Um, but for the rest of you, I'd say um, since the users requested a video on how to do this, I want to make sure to at least the video really helps that user instead of sort of rushing through it. And I try not to rush through any of my videos, but at least in this one, I really, really take my time to, to, to evolve the example, the demonstration, right? So let's get started. So let's start with part four and exercise one. And what I'll do is I'll start with some pretend data. So let's imagine I have a database or a table rather in some database that's holding people information. Now, in a regular relational database like MySQL, SQL Server, one of those guys, you will have a column and that column would have a type. And of course, you know, other things that, you know, whether it's primary key and all this other stuff, which we're going to ignore because that doesn't matter in Go. And so each column would have a name, a type associated with it, and then you will have a value. And so this would be considered one row in that relational um, database table. This would be another row and yet another row. And these would be column coming down here. Okay, so this would be a column and this would be yet another column here. Let's see if we can highlight this. This would be your second column. And so we have a column ID, a column first name, a column last name, column age, a column height. And our column height is of type float. Now, the reason why I have this is I want to demonstrate um, being able to take this data and create a structure to represent it. So our structure, we should expect to have these five fields with these name ID, first name, last name, age, and height and you know these appropriate types int string string unsigned int eight and of course float 64 and these are some example values and the reason why i write these as example one and so on put them in different directory and i do it before i start recording is so that how you don't see me spend time or i don't waste your time typing this stuff up like i used to do before and um, even when i do some typing i try to speed it up because your time is valuable and for those people who find that oh, I speed it up a little bit too much, just remember that oh, in YouTube, you can slow it down. If after slowing it down to half the speed and it's still too fast, then definitely let me know. But um, I'm trying to draw a balance between um, me spending too much time typing or the video being too long. And so for some people, they don't like see the video speed up. Please use YouTube playback to slow it down. And this is also to help the other people who, if you think I'm too slow, then please speed it up. All right, so let's now look at a type that I've defined. So I've created a type called table field and table field describe a field from a RDBS table. So let's say you wanted to describe. So here we had our example data. And so if you wanted to describe this value or this field, how would you describe it? Well, it has a value. We can see it's one. It has a column name and it has a column type. So we need three things in there to describe this field. And so I've done that here. 
by creating a table field which is a struct and it has a name field now this is in go this is our struct in go has a name field to represent the field name from our relational database so again this would be for example last name from our rdbms table or the first name column or the age column or blah 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 now we could have called this column name if you wanted to but let's correct just the type if we just call it name and then this is the string that describes the or name the type of the type of that value so for our field this would be like int or string or float 64 or whatever it is that we're storing time value or timestamp or something like that right and these name that you store here doesn't have to reflect the golang name because you'll see much later on we'll have to look up this string name and use that to actually create a go appropriate type so these name that or values that you store here could be the values from the database so if you had some piece of code that's actually looking at the database and generating um, the data which you'll see in a minute you could generate the data in a number of ways but um, let's say you're generating the way we, we got, I'm going to show it just now then you can still use that type information or that type name from the database and much later on you can do the mapping between what is the database type versus what is the appropriate type you're going to use in Go then for now we're going to make sure that all of our values, regardless of whether it's an int or not, we're going to store it as string. And when we're ready to store it in a struct value, then we'll say, well, okay, if the type was int, then we need to convert that string or parse that the int value from that string. Make sense? Uh, if that doesn't make sense, just trust me that this is one way and it works. Once you see how to do this and you understand it, then you can go back and see what kind of optimizations you might want to make. Maybe you might want to store this as an empty interface value, and therefore you are, you can store whatever it is that you want and did not have to worry about the conversion later. So there, there's some optimizations you can possibly make. But I'm trying to show you the most basic, straightforward way where everything is sort of a string. So we have that. Now, in example three, for our data, what we can do now is start turning our table from our RDBMS data into go data so let's imagine that i was able to read this data from my database and then iterate over it and get it to tell me what a column name is uh, for each field value and its type and then the value so now i can create a slice of table field values this represents a row because remember a table field value only describes this so i need a table field value for this i need a table field value for this i need a table field value for this and so on so i need five table field values to describe one row of my rdbms so that's why this is row one which is a slice of table field value and each table field value describe one value so one is from column id the type of it is int and then I went to the second row and essentially did the exact same thing. So this is row two, row three. And the only thing I did was now um, take those three rows and put them in a not a variable called people data. So um, people data is all the rows in my table, which is just simply a slice of slice of table field. So hopefully that makes sense. I, again, I went with the simplest, most straightforward thing I can think about. The most complex thing here is that we have this column value to represent a field, a field. And then other than that, it's just a slice of them to represent a row and then a slice of row to represent the table, which just sort of makes sense. So if you could somehow imagine being able to generate this, then everything else that I've done, you can pretty much reuse without changing. And so what I have now is a dump data function that just takes my people data um, thing, slices of slice of table field, and sort of print it out in a table. What I'm really doing is using that this data to print it back out as this, essentially. And so we can go through to we can go to part part three and see if part three three and see if how that works oh no exercise not i'm still in exercise four part four but i'm going to exercise three and see so if i go build 
and then I run the example, you can see that it, I print out that data. So this is the dump data function and I simply call it from main. And so in exercise four, um, what we're going to do, now that we have some data, we can start asking ourselves how we can con convert this data to a struct. So imagine I have this function called data to struct. And what I will do is I'll give it the first record or row from our people data, right? Because each row is represents one person's information. So that's what I want to turn into a struct with the appropriate value. So let's just focus on one row. So I take one row and I give it to this function called data to struct, which is my magical function. And it's going to return a value and that value I'll print it out. But notice how I print it out. I want to tell Fump that I want to print out all the fields and everything. Now, if you remember from part three, this is essentially what we implemented. We essentially implemented printf that does the percent pound v, which goes in, interrogate the type and tell you all the field names and so on. Okay. So we print that out. And so now let's look at how magical this data to struct is. Data struct takes a slice of table field because that's what a row is and it returns an interface value. Why interface, uh, empty interface? Because we're constructing the struct at runtime and we want to return a value that's empty interface, but it will have all the information about a struct and we know that we can always recover that because in part three in the earlier ones, we saw how you can take a struct and interrogate it to get all the fields and names and so on. So now we're going to reverse. So it makes sense that we should return a struct, an empty, empty interface value. And so when you want to create a struct, what you do is you call this function call struct of. And if you read the description documentation, it says struct of return the struct type containing fields, where fields is just a slice of struct fields. Now we looked at struct fields before because if you take a struct and you do struct of, you get a struct and then you can look at each field and each field is described by struct field, which tells you the name, the type, and the tag. So we can use struct field then to just create our, um, a struct and we can do it by having a slice of um, struct fields. So that's exactly what we do here. We have a slice of struct fields and how many structs field do we need? Well we need length data of it. So this row, for our example, we're using five, but it could be 10, 20, it doesn't really matter. So length of that is going to say how many struct field we need. And so we make that and we store it in struct fields. Now that we have a set of struct fields, one for each of our table field, we can now iterate over our table fields or our data. And for each, we have the name in our table field. We can assign that name to our struct field. So if we look at our data here, the names will be ID, name, first name, last name, age, height. So that is what we will use to say that our, our struct field of zero, one, so on, should have those same corresponding names. So this part is very, very easy. So now that we have the name assigned, we can say, we can use this struct of to say, create a structure type using those struct field. Now notice here that our struct fields are missing type. So if we try to run this exam exercise four, it would fail because our it cannot create a structure, even though it know the names of the fields of the structure, the fields don't have any type. If we imagine that oh, we're somehow able to populate the type for each field, then we can call struct of with this slice of fields, it would return a reflect that type to represent our struct. That's what it returns, it reflect that type. And then now that we have that type, we can call the new function from the reflect package, giving it that type. 
and say, give me a new value representing this type. Now, once we have a new value, we have a value representing the type, we can say, for that value, give me the element. So when we use new, we know that that represent is a pointer essentially, but we don't want the pointer value. We actually want the thing that's pointing to. So that now give us the value element returns the value that the interface V contains or that pointer points V points to. And so now that we have that value of the thing, we can now set the field values because this is essentially just creating that type. And this means create a value of that type. And now that we have a value of the type, we can set the values that we want on it. And, or we can, you know, return it and then have the, the, the color of this function populated, but we'll do all in this function. So let's move on. So in example five, then I haven't changed anything. The only thing I've done is added this piece, which basically says, look, since we're going to iterate over each table field, and we can assign the name of our table field to the struct field name, we also need to specify the type. And this is where I mentioned that we can use any string we want in our data description, which is here. We can use any type we want here. This could be the type from the relational database because when we're ready to map those types to struct to go types, this is where we're saying, okay, if the type in my table field value is int, right? This is the int that you can see we have stored in the relational database. Then I want you to use a go int. And what we're doing is basically creating a go int value here, then using type of. Remember, type of gives you a reflected type for a value. So we're using type of to create a new type. Now that we have a type, we can assign that type T to our struct field. So here is where we are assigning our, our struct for our struct field. We are assigning the name that it's going to be and the type. But before we can type the, assign the type, well, because they have different types that we have to take care of, this is where we switch, create an appropriate type, and then assign it. And so if our data set that we have float 64, or maybe it's just going to be called decimal in your data from your database. So if it's called decimal, then you can choose to use float. If it's called, you know, var char, you used to use choose string. If it's called, you know, once an int or whatever, then, you know, you map it accordingly. If it's called timestamp, then you say, I want to create a type, a value of time that time, right? So this is where you do that mapping. So this is the real where the mapping of the type come in, a relational to object. Now, by the way, if you wanted to remember struct fields also have, so let's say struct fields, struct field of I also have the tag so you can also include a tag if for example you're thinking about using this to write out to xml for example so let's say you want to read the data from the database and write out that xml you can use this tag field to say how you want this to be written out so let's run this now and see um, so let me clear my screen let's go to example five go build and I started with my keyboard noise. I apparently that my microphone picks up my keyboard typing and it's very loud. And so you can see, because we use in main, we say we want to print it out with percent %d. Notice how we're able to print out the structure that we have created that shows, yep, this is a struct indeed with a field called id of type int f name of type string, last name of type string, age of type u int, float of type 64. And in this particular case, the values are zero and empty string, of course, because all we have done is created a new value from our type, which is this new struct, and returned it. We haven't set any value on it. 
So let's see how we can set values now on our newly or new struct values. So I think we have accomplished at this point, we can stop because we have, we've demonstrated that we can take some information that describe data in a relational database and turn it into object. But let's go a little bit further and set the values on it because that might be something you might want to do now that you have this dynamically created um, struct because now your struct value the, is just an interface value. You can't really just call a struct that and then field name because we don't actually have that, right? Uh, but you know how to do that already once you have a struct, we show how to interrogate it to get the field name. So now um, we're just going the other way. So if we scroll down, what we really um, need to do is just simply look loop over our data. Now that we've looped over our table fields to create our structure, we created a value from that stru new struct, that structure we created at runtime. Now we can, we have a, va a struct value we can go through and initialize it. And so looping over our table data, our data again, we can now say if the type of thing we feel we're doing, the type of um, value is an int, then we can parse that value into an int using string convert um, package, parse that int, and I'm ignoring error. I don't expect any error, but I know that I have an int64 value. And there's the thing to keep note with um, reflect package. When you have, when you want to set a value on some reflected value, it sets the largest possible value. So even if your field that you're trying to set on is a float 32, well, it's gonna just gonna say set float, and it's going that set float takes a float 64. So it's always the biggest value. This little uh, part here, this for loop is the only part that we use to set the different fields on our in-memory variable. So let's clean up our screen um, and go run that example. There we go. So clean that up and go build. And then let's run our example. And as you can see, just as before, we still see that's a struct with all these fields, but then notice the value. One, Jane, Doe, you know, H is now printing out as an hexadecimal, but it doesn't really matter. And we have the height. So we can correctly not only create the structure, but we have been able to set the values on a variable of that structure, a value of that struct type. And so the only thing left for us to do in example seven now is to show that how we can create multiple values to represent each one of these values from our table. And so example seven, as you can imagine, is very, very simple because we already done all the hard work. And example seven is simply iterate over this people data. And we know that if we iterate over that, it's a row. And then we pass each row to our very fancy magical function called data to struct, and then we print it out. And this time I remove the pong sign because we know that this is working. So we don't really don't need all these things to be printed out. And if we go build and on that and as you can see all our value here that corresponds exactly to this so hopefully that wasn't too painful um, I'll push the code up to github as usual and then if you still have questions or concerns or suggestions do let me know if there's something that's specific that you want to see um, let me know too, and if I have the bandwidth, I can plan that to do it next. If not, you know, I'll try and integrate it at some point. Okay. My course goal lang for Taurus is on Udemy, and I have a number of ways in which you can participate. I would appreciate it if you enroll in the course, um, and you can do that by either buying the course, buying it at a disc, buying it full price buying a discount or just emailing me and let me know that oh, you want a coupon and I will send you a coupon for the free course. Um, my purpose is to make things that teach people and allow people to learn. And so if you cannot afford to take the course, I do not want that to be a barrier for you. See you next week. Have a great day.